my name is Allison. I'm the Programs Outreach and Youth Services Manager here at Monterey County Free Libraries. In celebration of Halloween, every Monday in October, I will be reading from the works of Edgar Allan Poe. For the last two weeks, we have been reading from the short story, The Fall of the House of Usher. Last week, we met Roderick's, Roderick Usher's sister, Madeline, and learned that she also suffers from illnesses, and one of her conditions is she falls into these deep, death-like, catatonic trances. The narrator then spent a lot of time with Roderick Usher and marveled in his paintings and other works of creativity that he does. He plays the guitar and he sang the narrator a song called The Haunted Place. He then revealed that he feels that the house that he lives in is alive. The next day, Roderick tells the narrator that his sister Madeline has passed during the night and because he is worried that her body will be exhumed for medical study, he wants to put her into the family tomb for two weeks, which is located inside of the house that they're staying at. And that's where we're picking up this evening. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. The body having been encoffined, we two alone bore it to its rest. The vault in which we placed it, and which had been so long unopened to the, our torches, half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, gave us little opportunity for investigation, was small, damp, and entirely without means of admission for light, lying at great depth immediately beneath that portion of the building in which was my own sleeping apartment. It had been used apparently in remote feudal times for the worst purposes of a donjon keep, and in later days as a place of deposit for powder, or some other highly combustible substance, as a portion of its floor and the whole interior of a long archway through which we reached it were carefully sheathed with copper. The door of massive iron had been so similarly protected. Its immense weight caused an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon its hinges. Having deposited our mournful burden upon trestles within this region of horror, we partially turned aside the yet unscrewed lid of the coffin and looked upon the face of the tenant. A striking similitude between the brother and sister now first arrested my attention. An usher divining perhaps my thoughts murmured out some few words from which I learned that the deceased and himself had been twins, and that sympathies of a scarcely intelligible nature had always existed between them. Our glances, however, rested not long upon the dead, for we could not regard her unawed. The disease which had thus entombed the lady in the maturity of youth had left, as usual, all the maladies of a strictly cataleptical character, the mockery of a faint blush upon the bosom and the face, and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lip, which is so terrible in death. We were placed and screwed down the lid, and having secured the door of iron, made our way with toil into the scarcely less gloomy apartments of the upper portion of the house. And now, some days of bitter grief having elapsed, an observable change came over the features of the mental disorder of my friend. His ordinary manner had vanished. His ordinary occupations were neglected or forgotten. He roamed from chamber to chamber with hurried, unequal, and objectless step. The pallor of his countenance had assumed, if possible, a more ghastly hue, but the luminousness of his eye had utterly gone out. The once occasional huskiness of his tone was heard no more, and a tremulous quaver, as if extreme terror, habitually characterized his utterance. There were times indeed when I thought his unceasingly agitated mind was laboring with some oppressive secret to divulge which he struggled for the necessary courage. At times again, I was obliged to resolve all into the mere inexplicable vagaries of madness, for I beheld him gazing upon vacancy for long hours in an attitude of the profoundest attention, as if listening to some imaginary sound. It was no wonder that his condition terrified, that it infected me. I felt creeping upon me by slow yet certain degrees the wild influences of his own fantastic yet impressive superstitions. It was especially upon retiring to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day of the placing of the Lady Madeline within the donjon that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep came not near my couch while the hours waned and waned away. I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavored to believe that much, if not all of what I felt, was due to the bewildering influence of the gloomy furniture of the room, of the dark and tattered draperies which, tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest, swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls, and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless, and irre 
irrepressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there sat upon my very heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm. Shaking this off with a gra gasp and a struggle, I uplifted myself upon the pillows, and peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened, I know not why, except that an instinctive spirit prompted me to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm at long intervals, I know not whence. Overpowered by an intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet endurable, I threw on my clothes with haste, for I felt that I should sleep no more during the night, and endeavored to arouse myself from the pitiable condition into which I had fallen, by pacing rapidly to and fro through the apartment. I had taken but few turns in this manner when a light step on an adjoining staircase arrested my attention. I presently recognized it as that of Usher. In an instant afterward, he rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered bearing a lamp. His countenance was, as usual, cadaverously wan, but moreover, there was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes, and evidently restrained hysteria in his whole demeanor. His air appalled me, but what anything was preferable to the solitude which I had so long endured, and I even welcomed his presence as a relief. And you have not seen it, he said abruptly, after having stared about him for some moments in silence. You have not then seen it, but stay, you shall. Thus speaking, and having carefully shaded his lamp, he hurried to one of the casements and threw it freely open to the storm. The impetuous fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet. It was indeed a tempestuous yet sternly beautiful night, the one wildly singular for its terror and its beauty. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations of the direction of the wind and the exceeding density of the clouds, which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house, did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity with which they flew careening from all points against each other without passing away into the distance. I say that even their exceeding density did not prevent our perceiving this, yet we had no glimpse of the moon or stars, nor was there any flashing forth of the lightning but the undersurfaces of the huge masses of agitated vapor, as well as all terrestrial objects immediately around us, were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation, which hung about the unshrouded and enshrouded the mansion. You must not, you shall not behold this, said I shudderingly to Usher, as I let him with a gentle violence from the window to a seat. These appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena, not uncommon, or it may be that they have their ghastly origin in the rank miasma of the tarn. Let us close this casement. The air is chilling and dangerous to your frame. Here is one of your favorite romances. I will read and you shall listen. And so we will pass away this terrible night together. The antique volume which I had taken up was The Mad Tryst of Sir Lancelot Canning, but I had called it a favorite of Usher's more in sad jest than in earnest, for in truth there is little in its uncouth and unimaginative prolixity which could have had interest for the lofty and spiritual identity of my friend. It was, however, the only book immediately at hand, and I indulged a vague hope that the excitement which now agitated the hypochondriac might find relief, for the history of mental disorder is full of similar anomalies. Even in the extremeness of the folly which I should read, could I have judged indeed by the wild overstrained air of vivacity with which he hearkened, or apparently hearkened to the words of the tale, I might well have congratulated myself upon the success of my design. I had arrived at that well-known portion of the story where Etherland, the hero of the tryst, having sought in vain for peaceable admission into the dwelling of the hermit, proceeds to make good an entrance by force. Here it will be remembered, the words of the narrative run thus. And Ethelred, who was by nature of a doughty heart, and who was now mighty withal, on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken, waited no longer to hold parley with, that, with the hermit, who in sooth was of an obstinate and maliciful turn, but feeling the rain upon his shoulders and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace outright and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand, and now pulling therewith sturdily he so cracked and ripped and tore all asunder that the noise of the dry and hollow sounding wood alarumed and reverberated throughout the forest. At the termination of this sentence I started for and for a moment paused, for it appeared to me, although I at once concluded that my excited fancy had deceived me, it appeared to me that from some very remote portion of the mansion there came indistinctly 
to my ears what might have been in its, in its exact similarity of character, the echo, but a stifled and dull one certainly, of the very cracking and ripping sound which Sir Lancelot had so particularly described. It was beyond doubt the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention, for amid the rattling of the sashes of the casement and the ordinary commingled noises of the still increasing storm, the sound in itself had nothing, surely, which should have interested or disturbed me. I continued the story. But the good champion, Ethelred, now entering within the door, was sore engaged and amazed to perceive no signal of the maliceful hermit, but in the stead thereof a dragon of a scaly, prodigious demeanor and of a fiery tongue, which sate in guard before a palace of gold with a floor of silver and upon a wall there hung a shield of shining brass with this legend in written. Who entereth herein a conqueror hath been, who slayeth the dragon, the shield he shall win. And Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him and gave up his pesty breath. With a shriek so horrid and harsh and withal so piercing that Ethelred had feigned to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like whereof was never before heard. Here again I paused abruptly, and now with a feeling of wild amazement, for there could be no doubt whatever that in this instance I did actually hear, although from what direction it proceeded I found impossible to say, a low and apparently distant but harsh, protracted, and most unusual screaming or grating sound, the exact counterpart of what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer. Oppressed as I certainly was upon the occurrence of this sound and most extraordinary coincidence by a thousand conflicting sensations in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant, I still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting by any observation the sensitive nervousness of my companion. I was, I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question, although assuredly a strange alteration had during the last few minutes taken place in his demeanor. From a position fronting my own, he had gradually brought round his chair, so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber, and thus I could but partially perceive his features, although I saw that his lips trembled as if he were murmuring inaudibly. His head had dropped upon his breast, yet I knew that he was not asleep, from the wide and rigid opening of the eye as I caught a glance of it in profile. The motion of his body, too, was at a variance with this idea, for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform sway. Having rapidly taken notice of all this, I resumed the, narr the narrative of Sir Lancelot, which thus proceeded. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, bethinking himself of the brazen shield and of the breaking up of the enchantment which was upon it, removed the carcass from out of the way before him and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall, which in sooth tarried not for his full coming, but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips than, as if a shield of brass had indeed at that moment fallen heavily upon the silver floor, I became aware of a distinct hollow, metallic, and clangorous, yet apparently muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leapt to my feet, but the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat, his eyes were bent fixedly before him, and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But as I placed my hand upon his shoulder, there came a strong shudder over his whole person. A sickly smile quivered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in low, hurried, and gibbering murmur, as if unconscious of my presence. Bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. Not hear it? Yes, I hear it, and have heard it. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days, I have heard it, yet I dared not, oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in that hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago, yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, ha, ha, the breaking of the hermit's door and the death cry of the dragon and the clangor of the shield, say rather the rending of her coffin and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? 
Have I not heard her footstep on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman! Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables, as if in the effort he were giving up his soul. Madman, I tell you, she now stands without the door. As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance, there had been found the potency of a spell, a hu the huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the rushing gust, but then without those doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then with a low moaning cry fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother and in her violent and now final death agonies bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated from that chamber and from that mansion i fled aghast the storm was still abroad in all its wrath and i found myself crossing the old causeway suddenly there shot along the path a wild light and i turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full setting and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through the once barely discernible fissure, of which I have spoken before, as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder, there was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the, violent, like the voice of a thousand waters, and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed suddenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher. And that is the end of the fall of the House of Usher. I hope that you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next week for another work from Edgar Allan Poe.